wellnesscouch.com, streaming wellness into your lives. Welcome to Nourishing the Mother, featuring your hosts, Bridget Wood and Julie Tenner. Hello and welcome to Nourishing the Mother. I'm Bridget Wood. And I'm Julie Tenner. And today's podcast is the 24-7 on-call duties of motherhood. So we're just going to sort of talk about the realness of needing to wear all hats all of the time and never be done and needing to, I guess, play psychologist and mentor without a break. Yeah. And also the endless jobs that are that are staring at you from every corner of your house. Yeah, right. screaming at you, I dare say. <laughs> so before we do that, I'd love to remind you to jump on to nourishingthemother.com.au and on the homepage, scroll on down past all of our downloads and podcast searches and courses that you can click into to have a look at and you'll see a red sort of strip that says join our tribe and you drop in there your email address and once a fortnight we send you a wrap-up email of everything we've put out in the world so you can never miss a beat and click where you'd love to dive deeper and then just catch up with maybe a little something that's been going on for us during the week. Mm. So nourishingthemother.com.au, scroll down on the homepage. Mm. So Bridge, should we start with your story? Yeah. There's so, there's so many. I know stories. <laughs> <laughs> but don't we all have them, right? But I guess this one I was pondering because you and I, like Jules and I talk all the time on text, like, you know, throughout the day often on all the different things we've got to get done as yeah. opposed to random little story shares of, of our days. And I said, look, I'm sorry I haven't got to something. Um, Marcus worked all weekend. And, and you know, knowing that, you know, I also, like I'm kind of full-time parenting during the week anyway, mm. you were like, fuck, I don't know how you do it. Mm. And I was thinking, how do I do it without losing my shit? Like what what is it that I do to anchor into that um, place of, of kind of constant parenting? Mm. Because it is such a practice, I think, to show up um, it, with as much of ourselves as possible um, without resentment, you know, w- when it feels like there's just too much. Mm-hmm. And so I guess with this podcast, I really want us to both um, explore what it is that we do to resource ourselves to slip out of the resentment that can eat you up in motherhood if you don't check it, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and and at the same time, we'll look for ways in which to create the space that we need to put back in. Because ultimately, you know, you, you and I always talk about it, like you can't give out if your cup is not full. So mm. you know, how do you do it and how do you fill it even when it feels like there's not even any time to fill it, right? Like mm. because that is the the practice that, that we're asked to dig deeper and cultivate when it feels like there's no time, when it feels like there's always washing to be folded or there's dishes to be put away or there's, mm. you know, something to be done that is that is demanding of us its attention. Mm. So how did you survive? For me, I had to figure out what it was that both I really needed. And this is why I think, fuck, like of all like this, you know, we put in shining lights these entrepreneurs that are kind of taking over the world. But fuck, motherhood is like one of the biggest practices of entrepreneurship ever. Mm. Because you are you in order to be of service, you have to dig deep into figuring out how do we get all of these needs met coming from a place of first my own so that I can you know give out Mm. and and be agile enough to pivot when you need to to look at the child like you know because I've been sleep training Sylvie which means dropping her day sleep and getting her into bed earlier which is working fucking amazing can I just say she's asleep by seven now that I've dropped the day sleep except that right today I'm looking at her at midday and she's eating yogurt And her eyes nearly closed and she can barely put it in her mouth. (laughs) I'm thinking, you're not lasting till 6.30 tonight. And so that's when I'm quickly going, okay, I've got to work backwards. Okay, well, she's going to have to have a nap now. So how do I do that and fit that in? And we don't even realise that we're doing this, but we are doing this all of the time Mm. as mothers. And so... I guess my story in the weekend was like, hey, well, all right. So, and it is, again, more agility. Like my husband's like, oh, you know, I didn't think I'd have to go this late, but now I've got to go here and there. And I'm thinking, fuck, okay, fuck, well, I've got to figure out 
how to get this done and that done here and make dinner, get dinner cooked but not drive, you know, past 2 o'clock in the afternoon because mm. I don't want Sylvie to fall asleep in the car. God, I remember that you phase. Know? And I think, okay, but then at the same time, okay, well, what do I need so that I'm willing and um, fulfilled enough to, uh, to answer the zillion questions that I'm going to get from my kids? you know, or feed them all of the snacks that they want to have or facilitate the play dates that happen abruptly and I have an extra child over for the af- afternoon, that kind of stuff. And for me, it's like, okay, what do I need right now? What, what feels good for me? Like would it be making a smoothie and knowing that I can sit down for 10 minutes and the kids are settled? Would it be putting on a show that they're asking me, asking me to put on that I usually wouldn't put on but in this moment – meeting their needs also serves me meeting mine so I get some time to myself. Mm. It's that constant check-in with yourself and the recognition of whatever story you're allowing to run you. Mm. So whether that's a story on, you know, my partner doesn't do enough or why aren't they home earlier or I never get time to myself or the kids are so demanding, like noticing whatever kind of looping story we're allowing to take up space in our mind because mm. when we can... Because ultimately you subordinate to that. Exactly. Mm. And then it clouds everything. Like you let it colour your whole day and your, and your ability to show up because when you're feeling that heaviness of, 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 a, of a story that you're running, like it's really, really hard to be you because mm. you're so clouded. So I think that that's what, that's what I try to do as much as I can and even tonight it was happening a little bit for me because... You know, he's been my husband's been working a lot, and I just don't feel like he's being appreciated enough for it. And so then I'm like thinking about all of the what I'm noticing my thinking and my pattern going into, well, you know, you working so much affects me because then I can't do my work and the house gets messier. And you know, like there's a flow on effect. And so it's about me noticing where I'm going with that, noticing what's an authentic need to have a conversation about versus what am I just projecting onto that situation just to make it mean whatever I want it to mean, mm. you know, and, and, and feeling into what those are because when we're having a highly emotional response, usually it's because it's triggering some kind of long-held pattern or story we've got running. Mm. And then it's not, I don't know how helpful that is. So it's, it's that inner work of constantly checking in and, and, you know, being in your body and listening to what's coming up there as opposed to getting stuck in this head head response, this head like thinking kind of autoplay thing that happens, which we then obviously look for evidence for, like, you know, we'll bitch about our girlfriends about it and we'll find all the other people who agree with us and we'll read all the articles that support it and we'll make it mean so something so big, you know, which is obviously why like these movements and these um, – you know, you see these articles and you, th- you think back to 70s feminism and the second shift and women doing everything and, and it can feel so heavy. But I also love the ways we can find the lightness in it. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, you and I shared in the Align Parenting group where you shared the video of like the teamwork makes the dream work pack up because otherwise what can happen is you can fall into motherhood martyrdom where you just feel like you're constantly picking up after everyone. Or you know, having to drag their freaking asses through something. Yeah, and, you know, yelling. Mm. And it becomes like another thing on your list because yeah. now no one else is doing anything and to get them to do something, it's another thing and on your list. And you're the nag yeah, and that yeah. doesn't make you feel good mm. and all of that stuff. And so how do we flip it and bring the, the lightness to it? How do we mm. find the joy in the monotony? Mm. You know, how do we make, like I remember reading some blog and she was, you know, finding deep purpose in like, you know, this was like a Steiner kind of esque blog. And she was finding deep purpose in the polishing of the floors. And I was like, fuck, that's a spiritual practice right there. But, but like, I get the point, right? Like, because we can choose to find meaning mm. anywhere mm. if we're willing to. Mm. But it's when we're looking for outside references of, am I okay? Is this okay? Like, instead of connecting deeply within ourselves, it's never going to be enough because you're looking outside of yourself for that meaning when you can look right here, right now, this is is a practice, this is meaningful, this is fulfilling. You know, finding that within the, mon- the monotony and the mundane, I think. Mm. 
What do you mean by finding what is meaningful in the moment? Mm, I remember like um, when I was really sinking into this as a practice a while ago and the, this notion of like every moment being perfection, perfection as an expression of, you know, a whole the being whole. a support and challenge. Mm. And I was doing it with, I think I think Sylvie was a baby and Hugo was, you know, three and a half or something. And I was doing it as a practice, okay, and this moment's perfect. You know, and then like he throws over some water. I'm like, and this, this is perfect too. Like and feeling how much I could make that mean something mm. as opposed to get flustered or annoyed because it's, it's, it's not so much what happens, it's what we bring to what happens. I love that. I actually love that. I'm going to start using that. Well, it's just interesting, isn't yeah. it? Because cause I notice like sometimes if I'm already, if the stress is already there, like Sylvie can toss something off the bench, which is a thing at the moment when she's having a big release. She can toss something off the bench and it can be like the straw that broke the camel's back and I'm just like, well, fuck, like, you know, yeah. and I'm struggling, right? Yeah. Versus when I have enormous spaciousness and I can just, that just rolls off me. Like I barely, barely flinch. Yeah. Same situation, different response in me. Mm. Why the different response? And it's because whether, you know, of how in connection we are with ourselves and how much we're able to handle, I suppose, those outer stresses that we are constantly dealt and integrate them, find meaning in them versus resist them or make them bigger than they need to be, all of that kind of stuff. Mm. And, you know, and, and you know, even like the scrubbing of the high chair or the stuff that just feels shit, you know, how is this meaningful? How is this thing that I judge as like drudgery? How can I find reward in this? Mm. You know, and like so you'll see those articles all popping up on Facebook all the time about, you know, days are long and the years are short, blah, blah, blah. And I, I think that they're useful to give you little moments of fulfilment when it does feel hard. But I, but I do wonder if, if it's as much, yes, reading the occasional article and also cultivating what does it look like for me to find meaning in this, to value myself enough to, to allow the world to value me in this. Mm. Because if we don't value ourselves enough in, in our role as mothers, then the world's never going to. Because we're never going to see it in the world. Mm. Whereas we is when we're choosing to value deeply, simply showing up, we will have that reflected back to us in our children, in the quality of our relationships, in the advice people seek from us. It's there. It's just what we're projecting onto it and onto ourselves in terms of the value that we have in this incredible, powerful job as a mother. Mm. I don't, sorry, my mind's going a thousand different places and I can't exactly hone in on where I wanted to start. I think what I really loved about what you said then was being able to consciously recognize what, I guess, the attributes list is that got you to a feeling of spaciousness mm. and what that list is that got you to a feeling of nothing left mm. in the same scenario that you'd react completely differently. So it just goes to... I feel like builds and stacks the evidence for, so it's not the event. It's not what's happening around you. It's not your child, their behavior, they're so hard, blah, blah, blah. It's you. Mm. And that's the importance of you. And you are the center foundation of whatever vortex or funnel or mm. whirlwind or calm, I have the storm you are in, mm. you anchor that. Mm. So depending on where you're anchored, depends on how much havoc is wrecked around you, mm. I think. And I think, I mean, sleep's a perfect example of this, right? Like so if you have really high expectations of babies to sleep really, really well and to not have an awareness of their biological need to wake up, particularly as newborns or, you know, even in the first six months, then, you know, even a few wake-ups a night is going to feel incredibly taxing and and just too much and has to stop. Whereas if you surround yourself with information that support, that supports the idea that regularly waking is normal and that you can handle it and that it's a phase and that here's a bunch of ways that you can make it easier on yourself, then that is not going to feel as hard as if you're mm. projecting onto it, well, this shouldn't be like this mm. and what's you're in resistance. Your, what's your norm? Yeah, just mm. like 
it, sleep's not a problem until it becomes a problem for you. And then when it's a problem for you, why is it a problem for you? Like you know, what's feeding into that and how are you perceiving it? And, and I mean, you don't always have to do this and there's a point what's at an which... an actual need versus a yeah, subordination. Yeah. yeah. Or a story like you were saying when you were talking about interactions with your husband is as you're funneling and spiralling down, well, he's this and he's this and this and it means that and, and, you know, and you've already gone on the trail. Yeah. Is stopping yourself enough to go, hang on a minute, let's just kind of pull this DNA apart well, yeah, a little yeah, and, and, and as soon as I started to get stuck in like, you know, fit, and also like, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll convince yourself of certain things just to feel good about your position and your point. Totally. But I could feel even... And as I was saying to do that, I could f- could feel myself equilibrating at the same time because I was being taken back to this morning when he'd said to me on the phone, oh, I just, I went back inside and thought, what else can I do? Like, what's something, what's something, else, what's something more I can do for you before I go to work? And so it's like, I didn't even have to. And I'd got that memory, but memory of this morning and thought, okay, that's just reminding me that he's both, right? Like at the moment when I feel like I'd really love him to come home and not watch basketball, but help me there's Mm. just as many times where he has put aside his needs to help me Mm. you know just like I'm doing the same often during the day sometimes I'm at my kids beck and call and sometimes I'm engrossed in reading something so I'm not helping them Mm. we're both and the stories that we tell ourselves about ourselves and those we love form how we see the world see them and ourselves and and to bring that that kind of critical look at at our inner world and what we're putting, projecting out is enormously powerful for how we feel anchored in our role as mothers. Mm. We're just taking a quick break on our conversation about 24-7 on-call duties of motherhood to let you know that Loathing to Loving program has a live round coming up and we do have monthly payment plans to split it up over 12 months and to go check it out on nourishingthemother.com.au L2L or Loathing to Loving program. And something else I think we often find as a good way to kind of balance ourselves is to think about who might have it worse off. And so sometimes when I'm feeling really overwhelmed and unable to hold it all, I think, fuck, well, Julie's got four kids. So. <laughs> <laughs> wow, I'm so happy that you did that. <laughs> I'm sure many of our listeners do too. <laughs> Yeah, it's funny actually. I um, there's this dad that I often just p- cross paths with at school, and he always makes a comment about my four children. Does he? Yeah, like <laughs> every single time I see him, and it just makes me giggle now because I'm like, wow. So the how many you have, you find obviously overwhelming. Yeah. So the concept that I ha- and he seems surprised that I look good every time. Like he just <laughs> like you know, so like, so you're not like you know that I don't know. Your hair's not like kind of a mess, and you can't like you dress yourself yeah. in your pajamas. And- yeah. You know, you know, hey, how you going? He goes, yeah, well, not as hands full as you, <laughs> or oh, something wow. like you know, just like something yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. And I do think, yeah, you know, sometimes I actually think that's a reminder to me to go, yeah, you know, I'm doing all right here. Yeah. Rather than feeling like you can get just lost in it, mm. which I do, I do ebb and flow in periods of that and certainly cycle through it in a day, mm. I would say as well. Mm. So um, what do I do? Well, actually, I have a funny story um, from tonight, actually. So today, Mondays, uh, my Monday, Tuesdays are, are quite busy and we almost, I almost hit the ground running on a Monday and we don't, we don't stop and um, it was my daughter's first day of, not first day of full prep, but first day of full prep and then we were going straight to swimming lessons and I'd kind of not done swimming mm. lessons yet because I felt like it was another thing, thing and an extra energy zapper and, you know. So I had planned everything around that. I'd made smoothies to take to school on our trip. We were going to have a play beforehand because that was what was going to negotiate her wanting to go, Mm. you know, blah, blah, blah. So we've done the full shebang. But what that also meant is Monday. So when my kids hit grade six, they cook a meal a week. So now I have two kids who cook a meal a week. So two nights a week, which is so ways. And so Monday nights is my son's night. And so I say they cook a meal a week, which is super ace, but generally... It's a, a absolute series of questions. <laughs> so yeah. I'm not physically cooking it. Yeah. But, but you may as well be. I'm talking them <laughs> through it. Yeah. So which I also realize is short term because while they're le- this is learning, mm. they're learning how to cook and they're learning what they need to do and they're learning mm. what you do with certain ingredients. And once they've learned that, they don't need to ask me that mm. question anymore. Mm. So 
And of course, this is my first, we're on like my daughter's second meal. So there's a lot of questions coming yeah. from her and less from my son. And so tonight was the first night he was going to cook dinner totally on his own. I wasn't even going to be there because mm. I was at swimming lessons and yeah. I don't take my phone in with me because I'm in the pool. Yeah. Um, so I had spoken to him. He'd walked in the door at, you know, 20 past three, rung me because I was at school and he's like, right, what do I need to do? Blah, blah. I said, okay, you need to, you know, fry the onions, cook the meat, turn the oven on you. But we just kind of ran through it. And he's like, okay, hangs up five minutes. He rings me back. Right. How do I open the bag of meat? <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I was like, just rip it open. Like, whatever, <laughs> you know. So it was a series of questions like that. And then I went to swimming lessons and I thought, well. We'll see how it goes. Don't know. <laughs> but in the back of my head, I'm also like, I am... Um, we, have, we eat dinner by 5.30, mm. so 5, 5.30. That works really well for the little kids because then they're in bed, you know, 7 o'clock. Yeah. They need to be having dinner 5, 5.30 to be able to do that. be ready for that. And they're really cranky. So if I have dinner ready at 5, 5.30, it, it kind of negates that witching hour mm. time. So I learned that the hard way. I'm finding that like, well, it's amazing how much because I'm doing this whole sleep program thing, I am paying enormous attention to the time from four o'clock onwards and same thing, making sure yeah. otherwise there's crankiness, there's yeah. resistance. Yeah. There's yeah. It's th- like being overtired, yeah. but, but with food. Yeah. Yeah. It's fascinating. It is really interesting, isn't it? But it does mean that I'm generally having already cooked dinner at lunchtime mm. or I've got it going by, you know, one thirty, two o'clock in the afternoon. Or, you know, depending on what yeah. my afternoon looks like. So it's, yeah. it's you know, it makes that part of the day busier. Anyway, back to my story. So in the back of my head, I'm already running a bit of an anxiety story about the fact that I don't know, I don't have control over dinner. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if dinner's going to be ready because I won't be home till 5.30-ish. I don't know if it's going to be ready. What am I going to do with these two girls, one who's had a full day of school and then swum mm-hmm. for an hour and a half because we played mm-hmm. as well, mm-hmm. and a baby who's done the same thing, who's going to walk in the door and want dinner? <laughs> And what if dinner's not ready? And if dinner and, and if dinner's not ready, then they're not going to get into bed in time, and they're going to be cranky, and, you can feel and they're going to be all going over on. me. And yeah, I can feel it building in my body. Yeah, but I'm like, yeah, they'll probably be all right. There's always toast. Well, yeah, I don't, well, yes, but I can't let myself off the hook, Bridget. <laughs> I have to have nutritious food. It's like I've got to get over myself. Toast sometimes. and eggs, right? Like, I eggs, know. Eggs I could. Meal. I know. I could. I could have made that choice. Anyway. I walk in the door and my, look, beautiful. He'd made what he wanted to make, which was these Tex-Mex pies. And he had to make, he kind of made the recipe up. He kind of had an idea of what he'd make and he made it up. But they weren't in the oven. And I'm looking at this pastry going, I know dinner. Like we're already 20 to 6. I know dinner's half an hour away. Mm. And I'm thinking, fuck, (laughs) now my whole night's out. So I'm like, why are they in the oven? Like that's how I enter, enter. And he's like, well, I tried to ring you like three times and you didn't answer your phone. And I'm like, because I'm in the pool. And, you know, I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, and then I look over. Next to him is his nearly full smoothie that I had pre-made and left in the fridge for him, straw and all, because that's the way you, you do like teenagers. Yeah, if yeah. it's easy, they'll eat it. <laughs> and I can see this nearly full smoothie that's not in. How come he didn't eat your smoothie? And he goes, well, it's too coconutty. And in my head I'm going, fuck you, I loved the coconut. It was awesome, <laughs> <laughs> you know. And I was like, ugh. And I, you know, picked it up and put it back in the fridge. I thought oh, I'll eat that later. And then something else happened. I turned around and he hadn't done something else and I was like, and what about this? <laughs> and then there was something else. And what about that? <laughs> and then he's like cracked it and he goes, oh, my God, stop yelling at me. And I'm going, I'm not yelling at you. I'm, I'm, I'm like this. And then he goes, and you tell me to be respectful. <laughs> and it was at that point I like went, oh, and I started laughing and, and kind of shaking my body because that works really well for me to mm. actually get myself out of the triggered funk mm. or dungeon that I'm in. Because if I don't do something to move my body out of it, Mm. my brain doesn't want to leave it. Yeah, well, your brain's enjoying it, right? There's there's a level of enjoyment that you get out of letting that top off, like blowing your top off. Exactly. So I'm like doing my, you know, body shake and I'm kind of laughing at the irony of the whole thing. And I'm (laughs) thinking I'm just blowing off steam. And he's watching me and he goes, and now you're laughing at me. (laughs) And he burst into tears. (laughs) Sweet. And I was like, oh no. (laughs) (laughs) so I just took five seconds just to shake a little more and thought okay there's stuff going on here for you and 
I went down and, you know, met him at that place and said, I'm really sorry. I, but here's what happened for me. And I said, can you feel the stacking? So it was this and it was this and it was this and it was this and it all stacked on top of and then I got narky. Mm. And I'm not always going to speak respectfully. It's mm. not always going to happen because I was really triggered, mm. you know, and we spoke about that and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, so we string the girls out. It's a little bit of mayhem and then dinner comes out and he did the most phenomenal job of dinner and I was like, we're all sitting there going, this is amazing, like <laughs> super so proud good. of him. <laughs> so at the same time I was like, this is also really cool. So the hard work of teaching them how to cook mm. and the hard work of not having total control because that's hard mm. is also making my life easier. Mm. You know, like there's a paradox there. Yeah, that's true, isn't it? And, and I mean, there's a, there's a whole new lease on life that you're getting now that they're at the age where you can leave Gwen with them. Yeah, you can totally. Like, you know, know that they're going to be okay if you go out without them. Yeah, yeah, totally. Know? It is really, it's actually really cool and really fun. Anyway, long story short, which you'll find this quite ironic. So I'm like, God, they're not going to be in bed, blah, 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 you know. And my husband isn't there because he's at basketball. So he kind of whipped home, grabs the older two and they go to basketball. It's like a thing for them. And so I'm on the like deadline of seven o'clock trying to get everybody in bed reading stories and, you know, Gwen has this bottle of milk and she was mucking around with it and I'm saying to her, look, are you finished or are you still going? Mm. So she eventually finishes this bottle of milk that she has and then I pick her up and she projectile vomits it all out because she'd filled up too much. And so her gag <laughs> reflex as soon as I've lifted her up oh, no. has just like kicked in. So now my perfect seven o'clock bedtime <laughs> is completely shot because now I've got vomit that I have to clean up all over me, all over her, her sleep bunny, which is her oh, one toy, no. all over her sleeping bag, which oh, is shit. her... Every, um, every crutch that you rely okay, on that she has. Okay, this is what I'm saying. Her sleeping bag. The literal and figurative crutch. Yes, yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And I just stood there and went, motherfucker, and here I was just like so annoyed that my son had stopped me from, you know, continuing on with my nighttime routine. Well, you know, hello universe. Well, was you, were you, at that point, were you, were you, had you gone back and blamed him? Like, <laughs> no, look, I hadn't. No, but I was. It would have been so easy, right? Like, because you, yeah, I could, I could moments, see. We can, yeah. we can see. We can just want to blame something. Yeah, right? yeah. It's like that Brene Brown um, video or whatever, and she spills her coffee, and she's like, "Damn you, Steve!" Her husband, <laughs> yeah. who's not even there because yeah. she's already attached all these things from the morning. You know, yeah. whatever. Um, so I just thought that was so ironic that. You know, she was in bed well after her bedtime, had none of her because now it's all in the wash, had none of her sleep anything. Yeah. And I thought this is just perfect, <laughs> right? Yeah. Like here's me being so worked up about the perfect bedtime mm. and it was completely shot. And do you know what happened while I did all of that sorting out and cleaning up? She sat on the couch with her big sister and she, like at my eldest Jade read to the other two girls. I just sat there reading together, cuddling and reading. Mm. Like that wouldn't have happened. Yeah, it's true. Had I been like right off to bed, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, it's true. You know, so I guess what I'm, what I'm saying in all of that is there's ways to jiggle your mind out Mm. of the dungeon that you find yourself in, I think, by Mm. connecting your body. So things like dancing and shaking Mm. and, you know, breathing is good and mindfulness is good, but I often don't think when you're in an anger rageful place that that's enough yeah I think music and dancing is super powerful or like you know if you really need it a baseball bat (laughs) yeah well that's what I do yeah I hit the baseball bat on the bed and scream until I get to tears (sighs) because anger is always hiding hurt yeah and you've got to actually get to the hurt before the anger doesn't need to be there anymore Mm. so I think there's a way to move your body and there's a way to look at your psychology of just the irony of it all and mm. where's the balance so where's the the very thing you think you're missing where is the support mm. you know where's the, the support that matches the challenge and I, I don't know I just kind of think there's a way as you said Bridge just to to roll with the craziness of mm. it but you've often got to stop your own thought processes long enough to do what you need to do mm. to fill your cup yeah And it seems like I've actually this year gotten really strict with coffee dates with my friends. Okay. So it was really easy with the school mums that school morning drop-off would just roll into a coffee. Yeah. And then 
um, that would either mean my youngest was late to bed to a nap or I was putting her to sleep somewhere else and then I wasn't getting home for a nap so I wasn't doing anything Mm. in my mind with that nap time and then I was back on the cycle again of, you know, getting shit done. Yeah. And so I felt like... like rushing for dinner and, you know... Well, I just felt like I had no part of my day that felt... I mean, I'm out for coffee, so it should be nourishing. I should be enjoying that as time out. But in actual fact, it wasn't really lighting me up. Mm. And so I've had to do a lot of processing around, you know, that social outcast thing. Mm. And am I still okay if I do, if I swim the opposite direction? Mm. And how can I swim the opposite direction in a really conscious way and say that to my friends and have that easeful and supported rather than needing to be a thing. Yeah. And, you know, I did that. I had that conversation with my friends and just said, look, I'm not really going to do coffee anymore because I've realised it's costing me like $120 a month Mm. and it's all this time that I need to be working and doing other stuff and having, you know, rest with Gwen and blah, blah, blah. Mm. And I'm not feeling as inspired as I'd like to be. So that's what I'm going to do. And that's made a massive difference to how I feel during my day Mm. because what is meant to be nourishing according to our culture often isn't for you as an individual with Mm. individual values. And particularly when you feel like that you're doing it just to go along with something as opposed to doing it with intention Mm. because you can get it. It can be easy to be swept up into, oh, just go on to this thing and everyone's doing that so I'll go do that. And Mm -mm. it kind of feels kind of nice but it doesn't always hit the mark, right, as Mm -hmm. you're saying. I think that's why I think it's really important to know what your values are Mm. and to be able to be really clear on what are the areas of life that when you honour them, they light you up and give you more spaciousness Mm. and energy. Even Mm. though you're spending the same amount of time and you're using the same amount of resources, Mm. you feel better. And when you feel better, you're able to anchor better in your family. You're able to roll with what comes up better. Mm. Totally. Mm. So I changed that. I also cut out coffee because coffee was a massive crux for me. Mm. So I often think we use coffee a lot like alcohol, but it's the socially acceptable form of the the old school drunk. Yeah. Honestly, I think. <laughs> coffee is is used and abused to such an extent that that we rely on it for numbing and mm. my world could be going to shit, but it's all good because I can have a coffee and then I'll feel better because mm. I could just have a drink, right, and take the edge off. Like it's an addiction. Mm, mm. And when I'm on that pathway, I'm not honouring myself or listening to what's driving those feelings. It's almost like an automatic I'm numbing response it. to it to not have to feel it. Yeah. And then it got to the point where I was feeling really sick having the coffee, which is ironic, right? Sick to my stomach. Your body's now saying, yeah. Your body's telling you. Yeah. Mm. So I actually went hardcore and cut out, cut out coffee and had massive withdrawal symptoms and a splitting headache for like a week wow. and parented not too fabulously during that time because I was pretty cranky. Yeah. But on the other side of that, mm. I've changed how I feel and I feel more inspired and I mm. feel more grounded and I'm eating better because my appetite isn't dysregulated by mm, caffeine. Isn't that interesting? And so I'm connecting again to my gut. Like, mm. why don't you want to eat? Why do you need appetite suppressants? Mm. Why do you need coffee to keep you going? Mm. Like, why don't you want to be grounded? Because mm. your gut is grounding you. Why don't you want to be? What will happen if you are? Mm. So, you know, I really realized that that those two things this year have made a really massive difference. My life hasn't changed, but how I feel and move within my life mm. has. And I definitely don't feel, I was getting really erratic towards the end of last year. So, or feeling that sense of, of just, I don't know, urgency. And almost sometimes like being pulled in a thousand directions, but on some level kind of feeding off that, even if it didn't feel good. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess on some level I must have been, but just feeling like I'm constantly running or suppressing a a feeling of overwhelm or anxiety, Mm. I suppose. Mm. But, you know, my life actually hasn't changed. Just how I show up in it has. Mm. And I think that's the difference. You've got to be willing to look at what's going on for you Mm. what are you honoring or dishonoring and why Mm. and what are the steps you can start to take to bring yourself back Mm. 
because that's all it is. Like our children is bringing you back to your wholeness, back Mm. to your truth, back to your groundedness. It's not that you're not. And willing, just like we ask ourselves with our children, to look beneath like the symptomatic behaviour. You know, the same thing for ourselves, look beneath like the surface level stuff that we find ourselves doing or responding to or reacting to to look mm. at what's that there for mm. what's what's really here mm. that's driving this yeah exactly and like you Bridget looking at what our beliefs are all the stories the words the sentences we're telling ourselves in our head when we're getting mm. triggered or out of feeling out of control and being willing to write those down and actually start dissecting them what's a story that's on repeat mm. for me that's hitting a pain point mm. and where's the opposite true And how am I trying to, what needs am I trying to get met that I could actually ask for consciously or say and use my voice Mm. consciously to, to make, to carve the space out for them rather than needing to be so angry that it becomes this violent. Mm. And that's the only way that you know to get your needs met because Mm. now you're resourceless. Now there's nothing left. Now there's, you know, that there's a way to get that done consciously before you get there. And and sometimes if we're not paying attention, if we're not giving it consciously, some part of us kind of knows we need to or knows we're compelled to but we're not doing it. The people around us will get us there. You know, you'll be called to put attention there because you haven't done it for yourself. Mm. And sometimes that can come gently and sometimes that can come with like, you know, a brick, <laughs> like, mm. depending on, on what it is for us. And that's interesting to reflect on too, you know, why is this coming up with this, that and the other person? Mm. What's here for me? Mm. As opposed to making it about that person or making it not important. Totally. Mm. So we'd love to, what would we love you to do? We would love you to rate us on iTunes and leave a Facebook review if you it's have big, five seconds. You know, we need to go and check the iTunes ratings because we haven't checked them for ages. And no, we haven't So actually. often little, lovely little ones that pop on there. So yeah, thanks, thanks to people who leave, leave reviews. It really just works it. with algorithms. So it just helps get us out a little bit further than what we otherwise would. Mm. So we do really appreciate your five minutes. Uh, if you've got it, that would be really wonderful. Mm. And you can connect with us on nourishingthemother.com.au, Nourishing the Mother on Facebook and Instagram. We do have Relationship Rescue, which we'd love to remind you of in this month of lovers. It is for all types of relationships. Mm. So relationship being a form, one form being of the lovers, one being co-workers, one yeah. being children, one being friendships, one being in-laws, they're all relationships. Yeah. And those relationships are always reflective of dynamics mm. and stories that play out within us. So we do have a four-part video series on our shop. So please go and check that out. You can mm. navigate to shop from our homepage. And what else? Loathing to Loving is coming up with another live round and that is where we really do work you through content. Yes, there's four modules but also the live rounds are five weeks of really getting clear within each module what the stories are that you're carrying Mm -hmm. with those, getting really clear on what it is that is actually a value and not a subordination for you and then creating steps to actually carve what we're talking about Mm -hmm. out to nourish and nurture you at the center of yeah. anchoring that family. And I mean, one of the, and when I, what I continually find you know, through these life rounds is what an amazing byproduct in terms of the quality of relationships is possible once mm. we do this work. Because yeah. not only are you becoming able to know yourself more intimately and particularly how values show up for you, you're able to read that in those closest to you in a way that almost wasn't accessible before. Mm. And, and every time we go there, you and I too, like we just get a new layer, we get a new awareness, we get, a new perspective and it's just, I love that. Mm, It is. It's really beautiful. Mm. So come join us for Loathing to Loving. We do have payment plans so you can make it work, I promise. So to connect with you, Bridge. SuburbanSandcastles.com and you, Jules. Is ThePleasureNutritionist.com. Remember to nourish the woman to rock the family. And we'll see you next week when we continue to peel back the layers on your mothering journey. This has been a production of thewellnesscouch.com. Check us out on Facebook and join in the conversation on facebook.com forward slash thewellnesscouch. Subscribe to each show on iTunes and check us out on Twitter. The Wellness Couch, streaming wellness into your lives. Whilst the Wellness Couch presenter endeavor to provide accurate and helpful information to their listeners, these podcasts cannot take into account individual circumstances and are not intended to be a substitute for health and medical advice from a qualified health professional. You should always seek the advice of a qualified health professional before acting on any of the information provided by any of the Wellness Couch podcasts.